Yeah, they're doing pretty good. They're laying again. We're getting about a, we average about two eggs a day out of three hands. Yeah, we don't need more. A surprise. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, talk with you tonight. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm a phone guy, so um, I know how to project just a little bit. Um, tonight, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about remote uh, station operations, uh, my style. I, I don't mean this kind of remote, however, um, but more uh, remote control of uh, amateur radio equipment. So uh, this is the kind of thing we'll talk about. And there are lots of different options uh, for remote control. Um, there's remotehams.com, uh, some of the manufacturers like ICOM, they have their own remote control software for their radios. Remote Rig has got boxes you can put between. Um, you can go back to basics and do remote desktop with TeamViewer or VNC. And a lot of folks uh, have some homebrew solutions. Remoting is not new. Uh, it's been done over you know, VHF, UHF links for many years, but uh, internet uh, has kind of changed all that. That's uh, uh, made it possible for more people. So I want to make this absolutely clear. I am an expert in my own opinion, but I don't know everything. Uh, and uh, so this is my experience with remote control operation. I'm certainly not saying it's the best way or the only way, but I would like to stimulate you into thinking about remote operation. Is this something that you might like to do or might need to do? And uh, I'm going to share with you at the end a, a little uh, video that I did not produce, uh, but might actually tell the story about someone who had to do it. So this is my story. First, before I forget, I'm going to turn on this little speaker here. I turned it off to save some batteries. First off, let me explain. Um, I brought some cameras tonight. Uh, and this is not because I'm, you know, well, OK, my ego is pretty big. Um, but um, what we do is, um, uh, how many of you here do not have a license? OK. Um, well, you have the classes here available to you, and I want to commend you uh, for, for making that um, possible. Um, but for those who can't make it to the class because it's not convenient, I want to make you aware of classes that are free. They're online. They're video classes, uh, hence the cameras. And from student reports, they're pretty successful. Um, first, I have a website. Catchy uh, title, w4eey.com. And that can link you over to my YouTube channel. Uh, and on the YouTube channel, you will find recordings uh, from multiple cameras edited down from classes that Tom, myself, and my friend Dave Ivey, KE4EA, teach in Greer, South Carolina. And we have classes up there for technician, general, and extra. Uh, and we're actually redoing the extra class right now, uh, but the class from last year is still valid. So uh, if you know anybody who is looking to study for their uh, license or would like to upgrade, then uh, I, this is an option for you. So a bit about me. Um, I was first licensed in 1969 at the age of 16, true, um, and um, had the call Whiskey November 8 Gulf Alpha Juliet. Of course, I never needed to know the phonetics because all I could do was Morse code, five words per minute, 75 watts input power. Um, I had a lot of fun. Uh, it really you know, stimulated me. Um, but that was when I was in high school. And a lot of other things came by. And so after the two years were up, uh, I let my amateur radio license lapse, uh, although I still continued uh, shortwave listening uh, for a number of years. Um, I worked uh, in uh, broadcasting, uh, public broadcasting, commercial broadcasting, and when I ended up working for a TV station in Saginaw, Michigan, all of the enge other engineers on staff were hams. And they said, Gary, you should go back and get your amateur radio license. And I thought, that's a good idea. So I went, studied, 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 and then went to the Red Cross building in Saginaw, Michigan, walked in with no license, walked out with an advanced. It was the code. 
I didn't go all the way. But anyway, so I was licensed as Kilowatt Echo 8 November Whiskey and uh, worked in electronics and broadcasting and in 1988, after an article in uh, Broadcast Engineering Magazine uh, about the Voice of America's field engineer training program, I thought that would be interesting to work on high-powered shortwave transmitters and to be stationed overseas. And so I applied, was selected, and worked for the Voice of America for 20 years at various overseas transmitting stations. Uh, first uh, in uh, engineering, uh, maintenance, things like that, but eventually into management. Retired from VOA in 2008, uh, came to uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I've lived in Greenville, North Carolina for a number of years, by the way, because that's where VOA has a domestic transmitting station. I managed that station for three years. Um, but came back to Greenville, South Carolina, and came back to ham radio actively in about 2014. Um, back in 2001, I changed my call sign from Whiskey, uh, from uh, KE8NW, to Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee. Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee was Paul Woodland. He was a mentor. He was an Elmer. He was the guy that really helped me progress in amateur radio. And in 2001, I, I, I looked him up and, oh, he was a silent key. His call sign was available and I thought, hey, I want to put that call sign back on the air because his was the very first call I ever heard come back from a DX station, a DX station in Germany. And you know, being in his basement with another you know, group of uh, explorers, uh, hearing this, it was just magical. And that's what really hooked me on amateur radio. Interestingly, uh, he was an instructor uh, and he and his wife Vera um, were uh, recipients of the uh, Herb Breyer Award in 1982 uh, for um, training folks in, in getting their license. And so kind of following in his footsteps uh, in my retirement by teaching the classes and, and putting them up on YouTube. So when I moved to South Carolina, I had a friend of mine, um, Dave Stansel, W4KA, who could never get my call sign right. He'd always call me Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee. And, <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, and I got in contests, and, you know, some, some contests, you know, they, they say Region 4, Region 5, uh, uh. okay, change the call to Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee, and that's what it's going to remain. This is just a little write-up on Vera Woodland when she died, uh, uh, and tells a little bit about the background uh, of Paul. So... I have to give honor to the first Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee, uh, George Rowand uh, from Virginia. Uh, and th it's amazing what you can find on the internet if you just look. Uh, so this is one of his original QSL cards that was sent to then North Carolina State University, uh, or a State College, I should say, it's now a university, um, and uh, to their uh, radio station, W4ATC, which is still active. Uh, so just fascinating. That was. The, the original W4EEY. So how did it come to be? Well, when I returned to amateur radio in uh, 2014, I had a fully manual station. Uh, Kenwood TS850, uh, Heathkit SB1000, some wire antennas. Um, and I started out at one location but ended up moving my station. Uh, I moved because of an HOA, although they didn't have a uh, specific covenants against antennas, my neighbors didn't like my tri-bander. Uh, and the receive interference was horrible uh, in the neighborhood we were in in Greenville. There were three 50 kilowatt AM stations within eight miles and uh, they raised the noise level. And the plasma TV noise and whatnot was just ferocious. So we were fortunate, I'm a very lucky guy, we bought a vacation house uh, up near Table Rock Mountain still in Greenville County, about 25 miles from my QTH. And so uh, we moved the amateur station there. And from there, I returned to single sideband con contesting, something that I'd done back in the 80s. I ran mostly low power. And the reason, because the SB1000, if I did a frequency change, well, you got to retune. Do a band change, you got to retune. So uh, operated at 100 watts. And I upgraded. I decided I wanted to know more about these things called software-defined radios. Didn't know a thing about them, but I took a leap of faith and bought a Flex 6500 and uh, replaced the TS-850 with that. 
Later on, I bought an Elecraft KPA 500 amplifier, solid state amplifier, beautiful. Uh, and with some software, it makes the, the flex radio a 500 watt transceiver. Um, well, also the antenna tuner the, for the, the Elecraft as well. Um, upgraded my antenna switching. Uh, before it had been all manual uh, switches, so I, I bought some Ameritron uh, relay controlled uh, switches. Um, so it's a much better contest station, but it still wasn't remotable. Oh, and when I, I got the, uh, the Elecraft, I uh, started using this software, DDUtil, for anyone who has uh, Flex and Elecraft. It's the glue uh, that holds the two together. Uh, K5FR uh, is the, the person who developed it. It's free, and it looks kind of like that. All right, so I, I made some modifications. I modified my rotor controller because I wanted to be able to control it from the PC, so I added the Easy Rotor Controller, or ERC. Uh, I got mine from Germany, but now I think they're available from Vibroplex. And uh, it's a project that you can do by installing in the controller. Uh, you can interface then uh, with a computer. Um, Denkovi, denkovi.com, it's a European company, I think Bulgaria. Uh, they make uh, these USB and uh, internet relay switches or switchboards. Um, you'll find also that they're made by the Chinese, SAIN, S A I N is another company. SAIN just stole. Denkovi's design. And in fact, when they uh, uh, sell you a board and they give you a link to their software, it's old Denkovi software. It actually has Denkovi's name on it. So it, they're not expensive. They're about 30 bucks. Uh, buy from Denkovi because then you support the original manufacturer and you get the latest software. So I added those to the controllers for the Ameritron uh, antenna switches. Uh, so then again, I could control things from a PC. Uh, and here are the controllers. You can't hardly see them in these pictures, but they're little boxes on top uh, with the Denkovi boards. And I added an external auxiliary controller just to be able to turn things on and off with another Denkovi uh, USB board. So this was my station back in 2017. Probably can't hardly see it up there, but uh, uh, I was able to uh, interconnect things with USB, with Ethernet, and of course the RF interconnections for the station. And that's what it looked like. A couple of 24-inch monitors from Dell, a nice computer in the background. Oh, and a Flex Maestro uh, that I got uh, to uh, work with the, the radio. So the station at that point was automated, but what about remote operation? At this point, let me just say something about internet connections, because these can be the key to your success. Um, in Greenville, I have Charter Cable. Um, Charter is an internet uh, service provider, so I have uh, internet service from them. And uh, at the cabin uh, where um, the station is located, I'm very fortunate to have AT&T UVerse DSL. Um, they're my only option as a provider up there, but it's out in the middle of the woods. And just to have that capability is, is wonderful. If you're going to try to remote using satellite internet uh, or even um, sometimes cellular, uh, you may run into problems. If you can, keep them from the same provider. Um, AT&T on both ends uh, would work probably about the best for, in my case. And does everybody know about DSL reports? No. Right? DSLreports.com. Uh, they have a, something called the speed test. And so you can go to this website and run a speed test on your internet connection that you have right now, and it'll tell you how good or bad it is. And um, this I ran on my um, internet connection on, on Charter. Um, interestingly, I'm paying for 200 megabytes uh, down. It's indicating I got 80. <laughs> So I got to talk to them about that. But I wanted to point out on the bottom there, overall, it says A, uh, quality is A. In the middle there, buffer bloat is A. What the heck is buffer bloat? Well, buffer bloat is something that the Internet companies do to provide uh, memory to slow down uh, the speed of the signal coming to you. Originally, I was... Uh, um, 
I have 200 megabits per second now. Originally I had 50 megabits per second. Well, in order to slow that down, they don't plug your connection into a, a sh smaller pipe. They just add delays along the way. And that delay is called latency. And latency is bad for remote operation. And the cure is actually in the ad down at the bottom there, IQ router. This is an IQ router model uh, AC1750. It's from a company called Evenroute. I believe they're based in Atlanta. Um, and what they've done is they've taken a router from TP-Link and put custom software in it. And the beauty of this router is it figures out uh, the paths that have the lowest latency and the best connectivity from point A to point B. And it has to be trained over a period of two to three weeks. And then it learns where you go and what you do. And now I went from a, a buffer bloat score of D minus to an A. And it really does improve connectivity. So this is a secret for remote operation is to have a router like this that can improve the connection uh, that you have uh, between uh, your station and wherever you might be. Now, it's not mandatory, but it helps. But why should I go remote anyway? I mean, you know, okay, I, I get in the contest. I'm doing okay. Well, I'm a DXer. I like to work, you know, distant countries. I like to work new countries. And there was this guy. You might know this guy. Bob, ND7J. Bob would always tell me, hey, I just worked this new country. Where was I? I was back at my house in Greenville, 25 miles away from my station. I couldn't work that station unless I got in the car and drove. And I, we get up to the cabin like two or three or four times a week. So it's, it's but um, it's like a second house, uh, you know, second home. But Bob was bugging me. So anyway, I thought, well, okay, what can I do as far as remoting? Now back. Uh, when Flex Radio was using their Smart SDR version 1, they couldn't do wide area networking um, by themselves. Um, they used uh, broadcast packets to tell um, that the radio was there and those wouldn't traverse um, over the, uh, the wide area network. But people uh, came up with something called virtual private networking, uh, which is active in a, in a lot of... Um, uh, instances for business, well, virtual private networking can bridge two different local area networks together. It may be built into your home router already, um, or you can use a VPN server that runs on a, another separate machine. And the, the Flex Radio community promoted something called Soft Ether, which is a Japanese software. It's free, uh, and you'd, uh, you could utilize it to uh, make connections between uh, two locations over virtual private networking. And so it's available at softether.org. It's free. Uh, it runs on a lot of different clients. Uh, it's capable of different uh, types of uh, VPN protocols, and it can be run in the bridging mode, which is important for uh, Flex Radio for those broadcast packets. Now, I have to tell you, this has all been overcome by events. So you don't have to take detailed notes about this because it's much easier now, but I'm just giving you the history. Soft Ether can run on a Raspberry Pi. It's not very, you know, doesn't require a lot of horsepower to run. And so, um, and a Raspberry Pi can run headless, meaning that once you get it all set up, you don't have to have it connected to a monitor, you don't have to have it connected to a keyboard or a mouse. Once you've got it set up, you can just turn it on, connect it to your network, and let it run. And so you can buy a Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, for like $50 on Amazon. So that's what I did. And in the Flex uh, community, um, there are a number of very intelligent folks. Uh, and uh, Rhea, N2RJ, you might know her. She's one of the new ARRL directors uh, that were just voted in uh, and from New Jersey. And Rhea, she's worked for some places that she can't even tell us that she's worked for. She is... Um, really just a fantastic computer person. And she wrote a script uh, so that all you had to do was download her script 
and it would download soft ether, install it, and it was almost auto magic. It just, just worked. So uh, kudos to her. So I was able to begin remote operation from home. And so when the text messages went out that a rare DX station was on the air, I could work them along with Bob up in Hendersonville. So that was then overcome by events. What about now? Well, I upgraded my radio. I had the 6500 and I upgraded to the 6600 from Flex. Great radio. Um, I replaced the Ameritron uh, antenna switching with an antenna genius uh, from 4 Oscar 3 Alpha. Um, Skysat, a uh, European company, also being sold through Vibraplex. Uh, and this resides up on my roof tower uh, and uh, in a weatherproof box. So I, that's where I do all my antenna switching. And it's connected back to the ham shack over Ethernet. So it's, it's controlled by TCP IP. I replace, well, I didn't replace. I still have the Allocraft KPA 500, great amp. But I added a German amplifier, uh, the B26RF2K+. Plus. Kind of rolls off the tongue, huh? Um, and I'd be happy to come back and talk to you about this amplifier. Um, Many of you may know about it, but it's a legal limit solid state amplifier using LD MOS devices. Um, it's a kit, so it comes in without any import duty from Germany. It's a German product, German engineering. The price, $3,500. Wow. Elecraft, $5,000. Flex, $7,000. Oh, and this has an antenna tuner built in. So. Be happy to tell you more about that at some future time. And now, Smart SDR version 2 has wide area networking connectivity built in. So no more virtual private network. You don't have to do that anymore. So this is the current station laid out with the 6600, um, the uh, two amplifiers, the KPA500 and the B26RF2K+, the antenna switch, and uh, a main PC that controls everything. So let me give you a tour of my station. This is my ham shack. That's a separate building. Uh, and uh, we'll show you some video here in a second. Um, like I said, it's in northern Greenville County. Uh, Hexbeam, a K4KIO, was my main antenna for 20 th through 10. Uh, it's kind of up on a ridge, so I've got great takeoff angles for Europe, Africa, South America. Unfortunately, this location puts a Sassafras Mountain right between me and Southeast Asia. So I've got lousy uh, propagation that way. Downstairs is a uh, workshop. Uh, that's where I work on things. And upstairs is the ham shack. So let's, let's go upstairs. This is the Osmo Pocket, by the way. And I just want to show off this uh, sign. Uh, a gentleman uh, down at the uh, Orlando Hamcation was uh, selling these, and I, you know, uh, for a reasonable price. And I, wow, I, I got to have one of those. So I did. Really nice work. So this is the Ham Shack. So you can see we now have three monitors. In the back, uh, behind uh, the monitors, I think I'll zoom in here in just a sec, uh, is my uh, power distribution. I just did this because I wanted to show you that box in the uh, middle there uh, is uh, the uh, USB interface that allows me to turn things on and off remotely. That's the Flex 6600 there. No, I can't remote the realistic shortwave receiver. Yeah.
And this is the German amplifier. Uh, so I just wanted to show you um, turning it on boots the Raspberry Pi. It uses two computers actually, a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino. And, and they are the, the, and what they primarily do is uh, provide the user interface uh, and then the machine protection to protect uh, the LDMOS device. But I just wanted you to see those monitors, to see the, the front screen here of the amplifier, um, see how it uh, works there. Focus? No, never did. So anyway, that's the station, that's local operation. So when, when I'm up at the ham shack, uh, that allows me to operate. I said I'm primarily a phone guy, although I'm bringing my CW back and hope to get back on the air um, with CW here fairly shortly. So I didn't know whether I was going to have internet connectivity up here. So what I wanted to do was just to ensure that we'd have something to take a look at. Um, I uh, did a video of my remote setup at our house in Greenville. So if you'll indulge me, let me show you that. We're walking down the hallway. And this is my office ham shack video editing room. <laughs> This is a Chromebook computer that we just had lying around, and you can run a VNC client software on it, and I use it, and that's the front panel of the German amplifier. So I have full readouts there and full control of the amplifier. This is the front panel of my PC, my Hamshack PC, uh, remoted via Team Viewer. The uh, Flex Maestro, which talks directly to the Flex 6600 and provides radio control. Like I said, I didn't know if we were going to be able to have connectivity up here, so I wanted to show you the process that I use to start up the station. This is TeamViewer. Some of you may recognize it. It's free software for non-commercial use. And there's uh, my HamShack computer, which I leave on 24-7. Uh, uh, and I've asked it to uh, connect up to the HamShack computer. And it, it has, it, it came up on a different screen, so I'm gonna drag it over uh, so you can see it here. And then this is the uh, Denkovi control software here on the left. And so what I'm gonna do now is turn on the radio turn on my Elecraft W2 watt meter and turn on my antenna switch. Click, click, click. And the W2 watt meter software is upper, uh, on the upper left and it just turned green, which tells me that the watt meter just turned on. So I can monitor output, uh, standing wave, etc. Here is the antenna switch, uh, the Antenna Genius. I have it set up for uh, SO2R operation so that uh, it's got an A side and a B side and it shares antennas through a matrix. Um, so I can um, go on the A side or B side of the 6600. You might notice N1MM rotor control software in the upper right hand corner. I can control the direction of the, the K4KIO hex beam remotely as well. And uh, here is software from uh, Flex. Uh, they have uh, uh, CAT or computer aided transceiver uh, software and then digital audio exchange software. Um, I realized that those weren't running so I uh, normally have them just uh, sitting down there. And oh, a radio has appeared now in the CAT software that tells me that the flex radio is completed turning on. So now I turn over and I'll turn on the Maestro. The Maestro is uh, an 8 inch touch screen with knobs and it's the touchscreen is exactly that touchscreen you're seeing over there, a Dell Venue 8 uh, that Flex just bought large quantities from Dell and put it into a, a case with additional uh, circuitry. So the Maestro is booting up. 
seconds. And this is all in real time. I didn't edit it down. Uh, sometimes it's a little shorter than this. Sometimes it's a little longer. Uh, actually, not much longer than this. This is about the longest. But And we're waiting for a radio to appear. I, I've already logged in to the Smart SDR server. And uh, a radio should appear. And then here on my uh, camera, I was playing with the exposure. So you, you'll see that... Uh, Exposure will change just about the same time as the radio pops up. Pop up. Come on. Pop up. I know it does. I edited this video. There it is. So you can s select the radio. You could actually have more than one radio. So you could log into different radios if you wish. Uh, the newest version of 3 software that is yet to be released is the first that will have, be able to have multi-client. So you can actually have two people logged into the same radio at the same time. Don't have that yet. So there we have it. That's the time it takes me to go from cold start up to radioactive. So, like I say, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do a live demonstration. But while we've been doing this, the radio has been running in the background all the time. I don't have the amplifier turned down at the moment, but I could. And we could make a contact right now from here. So here is the, the Flex software. Now, normally I have the Maestro running, but you can also run it on a PC. And here are all the controls that are on my Hamshack computer so that I can turn things on or off right from here. Costa Rica. So uh, you can come up and take a look at this uh, uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, let me just continue. So what I've also brought along is that after I got this operating, um, I got my wife a new tablet for Christmas because she didn't like the tablet that she had. Uh, that I'd gotten her before, actually. And uh, so um, I said, well, let me give you a bigger 10-inch tablet. And she was very happy with it. It's an Android, and she can operate it. It works just like her phone. So then she said, do you want my old tablet? Yeah. And so that's what you're seeing over there. Um, and it's what I call a station and a tablet. It's, it's the Dell Venue 8 running Windows 8, uh, running all of the software that we've talked about so far, the Team Viewer, uh, VNC client, uh, and Smart SDR, uh, it's not that powerful. It's only like 1.3 gigahertz, but it's powerful enough that I can control and operate my station right from that 8-inch tablet. Um, and this is this photo is from uh, the most recent hamcation in Orlando, Florida. We were in the hotel. Uh, and I fired it up using the, the Hilton Wi-Fi and uh, worked a, a couple of stations, uh, one in uh, uh, Scotland uh, on 80 meters, which I thought, yeah, was, that was kind of cool. He couldn't believe it that I was in Florida, but my transmitter was in South Carolina. But that was it. That's what we did. So thank you so much for this. Um, are there any questions? Yes, please. How many computers are you using? You mentioned the Chrome, but then you mentioned some other things like this. Problem. Right, so at the Hamshack side, just one 
uh, Intel i5 uh, Pentium uh, normal uh, desk uh, com type uh, computer. And then um, at the remote side, uh, for my day-to-day -day use, I use the Chromebook, um, this laptop, this very laptop, uh, and then the Maestro. So there will be three computers at the remote side. You could have just one computer at the remote side. How do you disconnect do your remote site during lightning season? So um, what happens is that with the antenna genius, when you remove power, it grounds all of the antenna inputs and opens the outputs going to the radios. So obviously I'm not there, I can't do any physical disconnections, so I rely on that. Any other questions? Yes. Do radio clubs, emergency services, different groups have shared remote stations like not that I'm aware, although possibly with some of the other technologies like remote rig or something like that, it, they do. Uh, it's just the, the ability to have a guest operator or to have multi-client in the, in the flex universe uh, is still coming. And so we're kind of waiting for that. So it's, it's not there just yet. Yes, Zach? So on, the, on the computer that's in the actual local chat, right. Right. Actual, not the remote, but the other one. Yes. yes. Um, do you have you everything set up to where if there was a power failure, everything would automatically start back up? Yes. It's on a UPS uh, that's connected to the, the computer. Uh, and so if power goes off, um, the radios are actually on a different uh, uh, power supply and battery backup system. But yes, uh, if the UPS, uh, if power doesn't come back in a short period of time, the UPS will orderly shut down the computer. Uh, and then when power is restored, uh, the computer will automatically reboot and come back up. Yes? Do you all have to be different in your remote? No. no. Uh, the FCC says uh, no uh, special designation uh, has to be made. And at first, I would tell people, I'm operating remote. I'm operating, op operating remote. I'm operating remote. And the answer I got back was, I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell. So I don't do it anymore. It just doesn't make any difference. Yes? As a follow-up to that, when you QSL, you QSL from South Carolina or in your recent example, from Orlando? From South Carolina. Uh, and that's, that's contesting also. In fact, uh, in one of my classes, we had to look it up, but that's the ARRL guidelines that, you know, you, if you're in a contest remote, you, your contest location is where the transmitter is. Thank you. Yes, Zach? One thing I'll also follow up on the whole tell people that you're remote is, uh, in fact, the other day I was on Soda Peak and worked a guy who, he was in California, but his station was in Florida. Mm -hmm. And, like, he told me, you know, he was remote and everything. And like you said, you could not tell. It sounded just like he had this big station. Yep. That he was sitting right in front of him. Yep. Well, I haven't operated at mobile yet, but... There are some people that are doing that. All right, so if you'll indulge me for another 20 minutes, I have a video that I'd like to show you that I did not produce, but I think it's uh, very touching and also very important because it might um, cause you to think about maybe remote operation is something you'd like to pursue, either individually or as a club. Um, Pascal Villanueva, VA2PV. Uh, did this presentation for his channel. Uh, it's called the DXer and the Technician. Now, um, originally the, the two gentlemen involved are French, so it's with subtitles. But I think you'll be able to read it, and it, like I say, it's, it's absolutely touching. So I present to you Pascal Villanueva's video, The DXer and the Technician. So I got a chance to meet Pascal, uh, the uh, producer of the, the video, uh, and uh, tell him what a, I thought marvelous job uh, that he had done in putting this together. Um, and remember that you know, eight years without amateur radio and then remote connections made it possible. So I want to thank you for making it possible for me to be here tonight. Any last questions? 
Thank you so much.